6 o'clock in the morning on the east bank of the Sea of Galilee. with the Golden Heights in the background. And across the sea, the city of Tiberias is just awakening for the new day. Tiberius is now catching the first rays of the morning sun. And to the north along the Sea of Galilee, the children in Capernaum are now arising for their Day of activity and education. And the Golden Heights.
6.15 in the morning. It's my place right in the middle. And we're going to breakfast on this way now. And every morning we're on the bus for lectures and uh, sight viewing at 8 o'clock. Go get something to eat. Jesus and the healing of the demoniac. Get this. Side. Here on the eastern side of the shore, the hills of Bashan or the Golan Heights seemingly end abruptly at the shoreline. They kind of plunge down into the Sea of Galilee. And you can see type of topography that would have existed during the time of Jesus, uh, very conducive to running a swine of herd down a cliff and having them fall into the sea, drown in the sea. All of these different hills that we've passed by, we've already passed by one, then there's another one up here coming up, are often hills that uh, slopes precipices that are pointed out by tour guides and teachers of the Bible alike as the possible or probable location of the of the herd of swine plunging into the sea below them. I think it's quite possible it could have been any one of them. So I'm just going to let you uh, look out the window and see what looks most appropriate to you. Now, just around this bend here, we are going to stop at a site where there's an ancient Byzantine church and there's a nice area where we can sit down and read over the text and look around us and understand what's going on in, in this important story from the Gospels. Turn 
apparently the northern end of the Sea of Galilee. We're looking a few feet up to a possible location for the casting out of the 2,000 swine from the demoniac at Gergesa. And this site has been identified as a probable location because of the tombs that are here in this location, referenced in the Book of Mark. And we're at a 5th century chapel site on the side of this hill. So this location was a 5th century description. But here is the only place that they can hang on to to avoid their eternal destiny, which is hell. Yeah. Right. Okay. So it'd be like it'd be like this. It'd be like you pull the plug on the drain, and all the water's going to drain out, and those little particles are going to cling to the side. That's what a demon's trying to do, so he doesn't get stuck down to where he belongs. And so he'll do. I don't know why I said he. She. <laughs> it. It. It'll do anything it can not to extend its time here, because its doom is already foretold in the lake of fire. And so it's like uh, I'm putting the cat in the bag. You know, it's gonna, it's gonna fight to the very end to do whatever it's got to do. And so they gravitate to anything that will give it time, or give it a reason to reason to do it. The Mennonite was asking us, you know, why do, um, why do we uh, have a death penalty or this or that? Let's say you had a melon on Okay, which for Caucasians is death. To quit death to want to quit. There has to be... Alright, we're going to try heading back to the bus so we can go on to the next side. Hey, Greg, see you back at the bus? Fifth century church at the site of the casting out of the swine. I'm just following the steps of Jesus. Man, you're going to be there like, uh, who was it? Uh, that is really cool. I mean, what is it? Yeah. So there's some kind of, like... It is. It's really, you know, I shot down and it was really good. And what do they use? I mean... Yeah, this is just a neat thing. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Trying to figure out now what's Where that? Gutenberg got his idea. Well, it became a huge, huge media spectacle and uh, a huge uh, event in Europe. Uh, it got huge coverage. It was like the OJ trial. And the world was shocked that a country, a civilization, as uh, 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 country leaders in Europe uh, were proponents of. Even Eastern uh, Jewry, uh, the Oriental Jews and uh, the Sephardic Jews, it was even less popular among among those groups, even though there were elements within those groups that thought it was a neat idea and, hey, let's all do it. North Shore. So, slowly, slowly, as they say in Hebrew, Leon, he told me that his brother, who he's recently come back
Gabby Burrett and we have Shana also pay attention to the uh, sky. So uh, this is actually fashioned after a uh, specific synagogue in Syria. I'll write the word of the Lord and oh, on your doorpost to remind you, like the same reason they put those blocks on right. the The word of the Lord is to be written on the doorpost. Adding on to you, have you would have a central room and then you would have rooms around it, rooms around it. That um, so you would have the parents living in this house. And then their son would grow older, and he would eventually take a wife. But before he can take a wife, he'd have to build an extension to this house. <laughs> and then he'd bring his bride home to live in the ho home of his father, uh, the father's house, which is a term that we see often in the Old Testament. We see it a few times even in the New Testament. But this is very important. This is part of the bridal customs of the of in the Galilee, in ancient Judaism, and in fact, in the Mishnah and the Talmud, which are later rabbinical sources that we'll talk about in a, um, later on today, we have reference to bridal rooms. These are rooms built by a young man and his father in order to accommodate that young man and his new bride and the new family that, that will come out of it. Okay, do you understand what he's saying now? Mm -hmm. He's speaking to a people who... who clearly hear what he's saying, know what sort of imagery he's using. He's using the imagery of a, of a young groom bringing his bride home after preparing a place for them. So this, this helps us understand, knowing the type of architecture that was used by the ancient Jews here in, here in Galilee, understanding Judaica, ancient Judaica, really helps us understand the words of Jesus in the Gospels. This is one of this is our main purpose in taking you here to the gallery. Now, this room right here was the main living room, and um, mm -hmm. it's fairly big. Usually, there would be benches along three sides. You, the, here, there's benches along two sides, but because um, in most most instances there are benches along three of the walls of the living room, it was called a triclinium room. A triclinium yeah. room, and. Um, Sometimes these rooms uh, within the insula, greater insula house, were called katalume in 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 Greek. Uh, this is the word that's used for the upper room in the Gospel account of the Last Supper, and that room was pro probably a triclinium room. The disciples and Jesus would have sat along the benches uh, and and ate from a table set before them. They would have reclined on the benches. We know we, we, we read of the disciples reclining on Jesus. So it would have would have been a room similar to that this, but it but in Jerusalem. So, so this would there have been a table? I mean like we there think there would have been a table in front yeah, of us. Sitting set. around a table. Yeah. They would have been sitting around a table, but it wouldn't have been a long bench like table like uh, I believe it's Michelangelo. Picks. Or in some not. cases, they were three-sided tables. Three-sided tables would have been... Uh, somehow there would have been tables set before them. But mm -hmm. they would have been reclining along benches along the wall. Mm -hmm. Benches covered in cushions and pillows and mm -hmm. things such as that. Um, this, like I said before, this village here dates to the Byzantine period. The remains here were excavated by archaeologists and reconstructed. And they used the Talmud as their main source, uh, their main literary source for gaining a, a window into the ancient world of Judaism. Now, what is the Talmud? We have, okay, okay. Talmud <laughs> is a, I'm trying to think of a quick way of, of describing <laughs> <laughs> See how much time we have. <laughs> <laughs> but if you could just remember, the Talmud is a rabbinical interpretation. It's a, it's a collection of, of rabbinical interpretations of Torah, um, it's actually interpretations of a, ba largely based on an earlier rabbinical source called the Mishnah. 
Now the Mishnah was written in Hebrew in the third century, and it was written down because Hebrew was beginning to die off as a living language. And so a lot of the oral traditions that were surviving through the rabbis were in jeopardy. They were in danger. So the rabbis got together in the third century and they began writing down the oral tradition, recording them on, on uh, paper for posterity's sake. And this is what we know as the Mishnah. These are largely rabbinical sayings dealing with Torah. Now in the seventh century, we had a second collection of writings placed, uh, put down called the Talmud. This was not in Hebrew, it was in Aramaic, and these were uh, rabbinical teachings based on the Mish Mishnah, based on the Torah. So these are, in a, in, in a sense, if you could just remember the Talmud as a commentary on Torah written in, in Aramaic in the 7th century, but based on oral tradition, based on earlier tradition. 7th century? So like AD? Six, AD. AD. So AD. about 600 years after Christ. So nothing's been added since then? Nothing's been added since then. We have, now we have plenty of rabbinical commentaries since then, just, just as we have Christian commentaries. Um, but nothing's really been added since then. It's a wonderful source for understanding Judaism, going back even into the first century, during the time of Jesus. Okay. Any questions? Anything you see here that looks kind of uh, different? I want to I point out what this is right here. This is called a window wall. And we'll see this at Corzine tomorrow, as well as at Capernaum. Wherever we see remains of, of insula-style houses, this is usually left standing for some reason, or at least it's reconstructed because it's easy to reconstruct. This allowed ventilation between rooms, um, air, better air circulation, as well as it provided storage space, as you can see here. Uh, there's also ventilation given through these upper windows. Um, during the winter time, this helped keep heat in the room um, by not having the windows lower. It also allowed light through the room, but it was a softer light, what we call a clerestory lighting, which is very common in different um, types of architecture, notably basilicas. Is they, they would have barns also connected or enclosed within the insula house. Um, so going back to the terms <coughs> of Jesus, they were in a keteluma, and they went to another room where there were animals being kept. It's, we always think of them leaving this, this inn or house and going outside to a barn in the backyard. But it's highly possible that this would have been a room or even a cave beneath the house where the animals were kept, within the compound of the house itself. Maybe upstairs The upstairs would be, uh, uh, they have this here as dining, but they could have also used it for sleeping. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Okay. The wood ceiling floor, or they actually have stone to stone. Um, they, well, the the roofs were always made out of thatch, like yeah. this. Uh, so, um, in the Gospels, we read of uh, the the, uh, the people taking the tiles off the roofs in order to lower the the, 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 the paralytic. But most likely, they had to do, dig through the roofs. It's just that that, that didn't translate well into the Greek world, hmm. where where the majority of roofs were uh, red terracotta tile. Hmm. So, so every year you never get there's a bunch of people coming oh, okay. oh well it's so yeah. I think you won't see this in the synagogue.
there are benches all along the side. Some of you are sitting along there. Uh, there would not have been seating inside the city guide. So you would have come in and either sit along the side or you would have stood in the city guide. So we are going to see a, a, an even better reconstruction of a synagogue tomorrow at 14. And we'll, we'll go over uh, synagogue worship tomorrow when we get there and read through some of the relevant biblical passages there that uh, teach us a little bit and help us understand the gospel within, within the context of it. So I just want to kind of get you close to this uh, synagogue in the the Golan Heights, as I taught you, the land of Bashan, this huge basalt plateau here was, was part of Syria, was controlled by Syria. However, Israel had the Lake, the lake of Canaan, the Sea of Galilee. And so all along the shoreline, you would have had Israeli settlements, woods and villages. But overlooking that, you would have had Golan Heights. So just looking at this map here, this uh, representation, you can see the logistical problems, the military advantage that the Syrians had in controlling this important area. This important area also controls a lot of the water sources that feed into the Upper Jordan. Feed into the Upper Jordan. So in 1967, when Israel was able to conquer this portion, became part of Israel. Became part of Israel. Now, in recent times, the Syrians have started ma making uh, motions that if the Israelis give up the Golan Heights, they can have peace with Syria. This is a pretty steep price because this has been part of Israel for over 30 years. We have people who have only known lives here in the Golan Heights. <laughs> We have people who have invested their lives <coughs> in this land. And it's not easy to simply ask them to uproot their lives and leave and let the Arabs come back into this portion of what is today Israel. How do we know we can trust them? Among other questions. This is my uh, This is a steep price that's being asked. That people are being asked to pay. So what do we do? These are all questions that are currently being or were currently being rolled over. Assad uh, al-Assad, the ruler of the president of Syria, the president for life, was uh, so was talking with the, the U.S. government about and the U.S. government was talking with the Israeli government, and uh, there was a lot of progress being made in these talks. And then al-Assad died. His son Bashar took took uh, took office. So it, it's it's a presidency. That'll tell you what sort of presidency exists in Syria. The uh, the talks continue for a little bit, but not as not as much. And with the current political crisis, I don't see I, I, I see the talks as being pretty dead right now. I mean, for the time being, there are bigger problems to deal with, uh, with the rest of the rest of the country. So I think a joke for many years now. Yeah. So the bumper stickers, there's bumper stickers right out there for you to take. They're quite popular in Israel. You might have seen, noticed them in cars. Uh, they're in, I believe, red, white, and blue. Is that the colors? The colors that are known to many of us. Uh, it's, it says in Hebrew, Ha'am, Him, Ha'golan. And it's a play on words. Am and Him. Am means people. Him means with. They're both spelled with the same two letters. So Ha'am, Im, Ha'golan, and it means the people with the Golan. You can't just trade land for peace because the people are with the land. The land and the people are one. So when you're trading this piece of land, you're trading our lives. You have this coin as well. Oh, I've never seen this one. Yeah. Ha'golan uh, is with us. Shalan is ours. Hey, right on. Cool. And then here's, I'm sorry, it's, it's, there's white in the background. Red, blue, white with blue, Golan. Golan is in black here. Ha'am, in a Golan. And then this one says, a Golan, Shalom. The Golan is on us. Mm -hmm. So 
These are free for you to take. Uh, yeah. We'll, uh, if somebody wants them, uh, they're right up here. And so we'll just watch the movie. It'll give, give you a good perspective as far as what's going on here in the Golan. Uh, how the Golan's been developed over the last 30 years since Israel captured it, conquered it, to go over this area.
Creek. We found an abundance of stones here decorated with Jewish symbols and occasionally Aramaic or Hebrew inscriptions. The most important inscription from the ancient village of Deborah reads, This is the house of learning of Rabbi Eliezer Hakapar. Rabbi Eliezer Hakapar established the synagogues and schools of the Babylonian exile in Eretz Israel. The synagogue at Katsrin is the most impressive synagogue discovered on the Golan. The oldest synagogue discovered in Israel is also here, dating back to Temple time, the synagogue at Gamla. The Romans waged a very difficult battle in order to conquer Gamla. The Jews fought bravely. The question is, why were they so willing to sacrifice their lives for their city? A small coin was found of bronze with one side inscribed with the word redemption. And on the other side, Jerusalem the Holy. I was in shock. Until now, I thought the people of Gamla fought for their city, their community. It became clear to me that they fought for the redemption of Jerusalem. They bombed the fields, the tractors, the children's house, the dining room. In the Six Day War, the kibbutz was really demolished. When we went up to the Golan after the war, it was the shock of our lives. We were standing there at Hirmetal Feet, just over kibbutz Tel Katia. I sat down and cried. How could I have raised my children here for the past 18 years with the Syrians first above, viewing our every move? I sit up here and without the aid of binoculars, I can see the cactus plants in my garden. Standing here on a Syrian bunker and knowing who sat here and what they did to the settlements below, I say to myself, what you see from here, you'll never see anywhere else. It's for our eyes only, even in peacetime, for our eyes only. The Golan Heights is a small area, but important to our survival, because the line of defense of the Galilee crosses the Golan. The Rokad and the Yarmouk rivers in southern Golan and Mount Hermon in the north are natural obstacles. The eastern Golan is a gateway to the entire eastern frontier, Syria, Iraq, and Iran. This gateway is mainly blocked by a series of hills. These hills are a natural deterrent and provide warning time preventing a surprise attack. The border today follows the hills and enables us to control the area using minimum manpower. Pulling back the line to the pre-1967 borders demands a much larger defense force facing the Golan. Mount Hermon, the eyes of the country. Whoever sits there can see the skyscrapers in Tel Aviv and deep into Syrian territory. The Syrians know it too. The fact is the border with Syria has been our quietest border over the past 20 years. 
The Golan is the security line of Israel, and security is a necessary element for peace. Another fact, the Golan controls one-third of Israel's water resources. The Kinneret Reservoir, including the Jordan River and the Golan streams. Any attempt to block these tributaries will cause a war. A war over water was already waged in the 60s. The Syrians attempted to divert the sources of the Jordan River and the Golan streams to feed into their new water carrier. The line of the Syrian diversionary canal remains a scar that crosses the entire Golan. Only under Israeli control can the Jordan River headwaters and tributaries feeding the Kinneret Reservoir be protected from closure. The Golan is undeniably an important security property. Even if one day we discover a way to protect Israel's water supply without the Golan, we cannot turn back the clock. An entire generation has already sunk roots here and has made the Golan an integral part of Israel. I born my four children here. My mother also settled here. My oldest daughter has already finished the army and my oldest son is just before military service. This was the intention exactly, that people would raise their families here and stay put. There's only been 27 years ago we came here. And you know what? There was nothing here but minefields, burned out tanks, rusting cars and trucks. And we made it into a fertile and productive area. That's what I call the true pioneer spirit. That's the essence of Zionism. So what do we do now? Pack up and move for a piece of paper from Kata de Lassad? I don't think it's worth it. We came here to build a home, and I think we succeeded. We have a home that speaks for itself. Look at us, 30 years later, we're raising our third generation of children. And you know what I think? I think if you can take away our rights to live in this place, for whatever reason at all, then you might as well ask if any Jew has the right to live anywhere in Eretz Israel. I thought to myself that after so many centuries, the Golan was waiting for our return, waiting for us to build and create all that we have. I felt that it knew it belonged to the Jewish people, and that the Jewish people belonged to it. Peace, they say, peace, but they've changed it all around. Our personal rights, our civil rights, things we really believed in. Friendship, mutual responsibility. It's all been sold for one word, peace. I think that if we really want peace, we have to hold on to the land. If you give up the land, you're not ensuring peace, you're ensuring war. The only way to peace is to maintain your values. You must say, this is my land, these are my values. Peace starts here. It is not enough to speak about the Golan Heights. Words must be put into action through building, development, and employment. It is inconceivable that we would withdraw from the Golan Heights even for peace. Anyone who would consider leaving the Golan Heights abandons Israel's security. And to you, the residents, you who have made the Golan what it is today, you have all my respect. Lebanon River, this we call the finger 
the value of the finger, it's only eight kilometers. Now, what is eight kilometers? You people know. Uh, this, the Yom Kippur War, we have two wars on the Golan. The first war, the six day war, we put over the Golan in 24 and 26 hours only. But in Yom Kippur War, we a big war. Our argument, why not give back from security point of view the Golan, is if we be sitting below over here, and then be sitting on the cliff over here, and then be doing this war, the Yom Kippur War, in this position, they be taking over the half of the gallery, maybe a right to Haifa. The argument is, why is the Golan so important? When they have us, we've been in euphoria. And it's been a big fight over here on the Golan. The fight being on the Golan, then came down to the valley. So we say, if we didn't have this position, how we could fight with the war? Another thing is, today living on the Golan, around 30, for uh, 34,000 people, uh, Druze and Jews, a uh, half and a half more there. We have some animals, cows and such a thing, on the border. And we quite a modern country. And we have a really problem with polluted water coming down the streams. Mm -hmm. Now, the Syrians saying, when they would get the border back, of course, they're going to destroy everything and they're going to build something better. Mm -hmm. But they're going to put on the border a half of a million people. Now, what will happen with no bad attention? What will happen if this all sway or from the factories and from the toilets and everything will run down over here? We are already saying this is going to be a sewer over here. We, not with bad attention, we're just making this fair. Another thing what is very important to me to point out is about the history of the Golan. Many people say, okay, we took over the Golan and we played right on that Golan. We can prove already for 2,000 years, Jews been living on the Golan. We have 33 proof places on the Golan. The Syrians don't have nothing on the Golan. The argument when we lost the Golan is only in the 1926, 24, and 22 when the argument has been in Europe and they decide about the line, how it will, how it will, uh, uh, how will be the border. A very important last thing, what I will say, I don't want to make a long speech, uh, what is important to mention is, now we have a prime minister who has been willing to give back everything, everything, just small parts what he, he didn't include in the agreement. Even then, Syria didn't accept to give, to take back. And why is that? They don't mean peace. They don't see the Israel country uh, like a part in the military. And this is the argument, like now with the Palestinians and all this argument, we can prove if they want the peace, it's not a problem. Even we sit on the Golan and you have an argument about the place, we can make some agreement or arrangement. It's many ways how to solve out this problem. But they want it all the Golan back and right to, you know, and just for the to make it clear, the, the argument is over here about 700 meters. From the cliff to the water, this is the border of the human where they have, this is what we saw in the picture when the woman talking about the country. It's only 700 meters. Only 700 meters. And they wanted to sit on the water. The argument between Israel and the Syrian, because if you touch in the water, by international law, a half of the canaries belong to you, half the Sea of Galilee. Mm -hmm. And already it's proved when the Syrians been sitting on the Golan and they attacked Israel after Israel came to be a state in 48, they attacked Israel the same night when we got our independence. And they attacked them, probably the guy can tell you all the stories about it. And they want to destroy Israel completely. And we, with a small minority of soldiers, we take it over. And now we're sitting by right on the Golan. It's nothing to do if we not have right to sit over there. It's just by a chance we couldn't take it over in 48. That's all, because we didn't have enough power. If somebody wants to ask something, so please. So? Don't, they don't, don't have We're heading toward the Syrian border.
in uh, northern Israel. And a number of these high points, about 18 of them, are actually volcanic uh, mountains. Uh, they have erupted and uh, created this form. And now, as you can see on the top, that's a basis of Israelite communication systems. To Conflict potential between Syria and Israel is also very, very great. But not at this particular moment because of the other crises in which they're involved. Get out and get some good pictures here. We are now looking at a United Nation peacekeeping community separating Israel, where we're standing, from Syria in the background. <laughs> United Nations peacekeeping. And beyond, in the distance, is a Syrian town that, in consequence to conflict, has been abandoned. This, then, is the road to Damascus. Throughout all history, a very critical road, Egypt sometimes going north, Syria sometimes coming from the south, from the north, a very critical road, the road to Damascus. Of course, we're not going into Syria, but there's no reason why we can't take a little look at Syria. And there's some of their power source from the Syrian hills. We've seen a lot of Israel tank installations along this road, so this is definitely a border area. We're going to work our way over the landscape of Syria. We're going to be looking north, the biblical northern extremity of Israel, and we're going to be looking right now at Mount Hermon, believed by most Christian scholars to be the Mount of Jesus Ascension. So we're going to look through the fog, zoom in on Mount Hermon, hoping that some of it will be visible. We're going to climb the hill right behind us. We're going to look at a communication installation maintained by Israel. Israel is very high tech. Now, what's that called again? But it's Yeah. What's that called? 
I call it Arbuthnall. Arbuthnall. They're like, it's like pretty built up up there. It's like... It's a large military town. They had like... Because we went there, was like... It was pretty commercialized. There was... They had a coffee shop. They had like... Comfort the bus. Who is outside? Telling the story. United Nations peacekeeping camp standing between Syria and Israel. Damascus can be seen in the distance. until 1967. A close look at these uh, Syrian bunkers here. Many of them are potmarked with bullet holes. drive through a town here. This is the modern Druze town. We all know now what the Druze are. You'll hopefully get to see a lot of them walking along the streets. Uh, the Druze have a messianic belief. Uh, the, the name of the town is Pekat. That's the name of the town we're driving through. Now let me explain to you a little bit about the Druze messianic belief system. The Druze be believe that a messiah will come for them. The unique thing of this of this Messiah is that he will be born to a man, one of the chosen elect of the Druze. The Druze is a very secretive it's a mystery religion. Uh, you have to you have to be born into the Druze religion, and once you're born into it, you have to choose at an early stage in your life whether you want to be prepared to receive the mysteries of your faith. And so, not all Druze men are uh, qualified for this, but if they are. Uh, they, they are distinguished by the fact that they wear very baggy pants. So when the Messiah comes and he's born all of a sudden, uh, he can just fall down their pant legs. I don't know. It, it, the, the pants have something to do with, <laughs> with the, uh, the birth of this Messiah. So keep your eyes open. I've already seen one Jewish man wearing baggy pants. Actually, right inside Joppa Gate, when you go inside Joppa Gate, there's a Drew's vendor who usually uh, hangs out there. This is a Drew's town at the foot of Mount Hermon. The Drew's mystery religion is fascinating. We'll have to look into that a little bit more. Looking at Mount Hermon. castle that was first built by the Crusaders. It was later it was later occupied, actually during the Crusades, it was captured by the Muslims and 
has been controlled and occupied them up until the modern time period. Can you see a way off in the distance? Okay. Immediately across the valley, valley from us is a small Druze village. All right, past it, way off in the distance. Can, can you all see? Do you all see the uh, castle there? Yeah. Okay. That that castle is called Nimrod's Castle. The Muslim faithful love Nimrod the Hunter that we read of in the Book of Genesis. And so, the local folklore here said that Nimrod built that castle. Now, as far as historical accuracy rating, uh, zero. Zero. It was built by Crusaders and then later rebuilt by Muslims. But there's an interesting story behind this. And here, here it goes. During the Crusades, during most of the Crusades, that castle was controlled by the Muslims. In fact, it was controlled by a specific Muslim sect. This Muslim sect revolved around a man that was known by both the Muslims and the Christians as the Old Man of the Mountain. And he was, re he was uh, hated by both the Muslims and the Christians because his sect um, was a sect of assassins. They were, they were holed up here in the mountain. They couldn't be conquered by either the Muslims or the Crusaders. And the followers of this old man of the mountain were so devout for its temple to Pan. This was a hotbed of pagan worship here in this area. And so because of, it was known as for its temple to Pan, it became Pontius as a, as a nice capital city for him to live in. He built a palace here. And he dedicated it to his Roman patron, Caesar. And so it became known as Caesarea. But to d d distinguish it from the Caesarea that we visited yesterday along the Mediterranean Sea, it was called Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea of Philip. That was the official name of the city. However, it's continued to be known as Pontius, Caesarea Pontius. But we have it referred to in our New Testament as Caesarea Philippi. Uh, now today it's called Pontius, Pontius. That's simply the Arab uh, pronunciation of Pontius. A lot of times Arabs have difficulty pronouncing the ba, or the pa, rather the pa, pa sound. So Pan became Ban, Pontius became Pontius. So we're gonna go. We're gonna stop there now. We are now at Caesarea Philippi, just beneath Mount Hermon. This is worthy of some discussion. And this statement gives a very interesting backdrop to the question of Jesus and the answer of Peter. Who do you say that I am in this area of paganism, Caesarea Philippi? Christians were not terribly interested in this, but for background, to appreciate the 16th chapter of Matthew, it's very helpful.
from? <laughs> Here, I want to try getting up. Scott, we got up on top of it. We already got a Dan, the northern extremity of the ancient Israel, as well as the modern Israel, I believe, in the time of Christ. This is Dan, one of the headwaters of the Jordan River. There are others in the area, but this is just a nice relaxing stop. And turning south, these waters are now flowing into Tula, and then beyond into the Sea of Galilee, and make up the beautiful location where we'll be staying two nights in a row on the Sea of Galilee. The water travels another 45 miles and becomes stagnant in the Dead Sea. This is a cultic site that we're entering into. We've walked a long way up following the stream of Dan from Dan that leads into the Jordan River. I would like to finish this beautiful day, November 1st, the year 2000, on the Sea of Galilee, uh, pretty much at the same point that we began the tape and experienced the beautiful sunrise. Just now, we've returned from a trip with our bus driver over to the other side of the lake to Tiberias where this was just some free time and we enjoyed going through a diamond factory and tremendous display. One of our party did make a significant purchase. The rest of us just enjoyed the discussion and movie and display of exotic jewelry that uh, was on display. About 60 percent of the diamonds are processed through this place in Jerusalem of the world's diamonds. I just want to mention that right now I'm 
standing on grass, the luscious, most luscious grass that I've ever stood on in my life. It's just unusual. It's an unusual type of grass. And we're focusing south down the Sea of Galilee. And I want to call something to your attention. These lights along here are along the shoreline. But all over Israel, made up of hills, most everything is, as we're going to see at the north end of the Sea of Galilee a little more clearly, most all of the building and communities are on levels like this. And of course, most of them are on the tops of the ridges, the tops of the mountains in this area. But they seem to be scattered out all over Israel. So far, we've traveled about 150 miles north and south from Dan to Beersheba. And we've crisscrossed the land about three times. Still have about three, four more days. And each day seems to be more exciting than the day before. I'm going to eat my 7.30 meal at this time. So we'll say good night. And interested in finding out what kind of food we have tonight. Because there's been quite a variety. And I cannot honestly say... I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed, I've learned how to eat pita bread and stuff pita bread with all kinds of unknown morsels. And I'm getting more accustomed to it, but for a while I had a little bit of difficulty. So, good night.